If you are interested just in headlines, you can use, you know, websites like 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 Waymo. If you want to just see pictures, you can go to WeChat. If you want to get just comments, you can use social networks. If you want, you know, learn about recommendations, what else could you read? You can use you can use these news apps that aggregate content from many sources. You don't need to go to any particular brand website to learn that. And in fact, publishers are, you know, helping and bundling their content. So these are the biggest publishers in the United States. BuzzFeed, CNN, Fox, Huffington Post, The New York Times, Vox, Wall Street Journal, Washington Post. And these are the platforms that they currently publish on. It's Amazon Alexa, Apple News, Apple Watch, Facebook, Flipboard, Google AMP, Instagram, uh, whatever, uh, Kik, uh, LinkedIn, Line, List, Messenger, Mobile App, Pinterest, whatever. 22 different platforms. The more they unbundle their content, the less value it has. And you can ask, of course, yourself, is China much different? What are the most popular entry points for news for Chinese consumers? Are these publishers' websites? Are these publishers' apps? Or rather, aggregators and social networks? Unbundling is happening all over the world and it's changing. And it's, and, and, and it's, and it's happening because consumers get new choices. That they use. Then the second wave, we call it disintermediation. In the past, if you wanted to publish something, you actually needed to talk to journalists at the publishing house to convince them to write a story about you, or you could pay for an advertisement and have your and have your content published in the in the, in the periodical as an ad. But today, everybody can become a publisher. This boy is just eight years old. He lives in California with his parents. And they are shooting a video every day when he gets a new toy and starts playing with it. This is actually the most popular children television network in the United States. They have 14 million channel subscribers on YouTube. Compare it with 400,000 of subscribers of Cartoon Network, that is very well known children's television. Or the most popular children's television in the States is called Nickelodeon, 1 million subscribers. So Ryan, with his parents, is running a bigger media company than established TV stations do today. If we talk about the size of their audience. And by the way, they are millionaires already. The biggest challenge they are business faces is that Ryan is aging. What can they do if he, you know, gets too old to play with the toys? The business is dependent on them having more babies. And then what the platforms do? The platforms provide users with new publishing tools. You get a sort of a free content management system and free distribution system. So you can publish the story. These are two stories on Facebook that actually have been the most engaging stories on Facebook published before the American presidential elections. One of them is published by the respected Washington Post, a very respected newspaper. Uh, the article is written by Ann Applebaum. They are very respected columnists. The other story is published by a website nobody knows. It's called the Daily, the Daily Presser. And the author is hidden under the nickname the American Patriot. One of these stories is true, the other is false. But you cannot actually see the difference. The design of these stories is the same. The way they look on the Facebook network is the same. Why is it? Is it the mistake of a platform? Or actually, it is the feature of the architecture. This is how they were built. They were built to let everybody become a publisher. So they can interchange the suppliers. If any publisher says, I, don't, I no longer want to publish on your platform, the platform can say, goodbye, I have millions of others. 
That's why the platforms want to commoditize their suppliers and they want to commoditize their content. Is China any different? You know, there are some studies about misinformation on WeChat, and what we see is that these stories are actually, they actually look very similar. The content that is truthful, the content that is provided by a professional publisher and by an amateur looks exactly the same. And it, you need to be an expert to actually recognize. Why is that? Because the platform wants to commoditize the content. Platforms want to have an interchangeability of suppliers. You are the supplier, unfortunately. And then the third wave of disruption. We call it decoupling at Harvard Business School. How it works. Look at that. You may remember it from your business studies. It's the consumer uh, uh, purchase decision process, or customer journey, people call it, or a purchase funnel. Whatever the name, is the same thing. So, if I want to learn news, I want to consume content, I first usually choose the medium, so I decide whether I, I'm going to do it online, or I'm going to watch television, or maybe buy a print magazine. Then, I'm usually choosing the brand. So, you know, what brand do I know? What would I, what do I like? And then I'm, I need to go to a website, I need to go to an app, then I need to browse for content. I need to find the content that is actually interesting to me. There is plenty of content, so I'm browsing. And then finally, I'm consuming content, and by the way, I'm noticing the ads. The thing is, that from the perspective of a publisher, what is important is that somebody visits your website or an app consumes the content because this is the opportunity for us to show the ads and actually make money. But you know, from the perspective of a consumer, it's not that easy. From the perspective of the consumer, you know, choosing the medium, brand, visiting a website, then thinking about, you know, where is my content, searching for it. It's all, you know, it's effort, it's time, it's money. They hate it. They don't need it. It's useless. It's eroding the volume. What they want to do, they just want to get to their content. And by the way, I don't know, I know nothing about China, but in the West, in the West people hate advertising. People just hate the ads, especially online ads. They are very intrusive. They just hate it. They, they would do anything to avoid them. And this is what they do with technology. By going to Facebook, for example, in the West, what you can do, you don't need to think about a brand, because all brands are on Facebook. You don't need to actually, you know, think about which website, whatever. You just go to one app that you have on the first screen of your mobile phone. And then, you don't need to browse for content, because Facebook has all these algorithms, artificial intelligence, that will be choosing just the stories interesting to you. So actually, you save time, you save effort, and you save money, and you get right to the content that you want to read. And by the way, there is fewer ads. So it's the consumer that is using technology like a platform like Facebook or like WeChat to actually do minimize the costs and uh, maximize the value that they get from a product. It's the consumer that is the disruptor. When I've done a survey among the world publi world's publishers, what, I, what, I, what, I, what I've heard is that most of the publishers, 82%, told me that digital display advertising is their main business model in the digital, despite, as we see, it's completely disruptive. And 70% told me that they use digital platforms such as Facebook mainly as the distribution channel for content, despite it is not a distribution channel, it's your competitor. So where is the money? In the West, the money is actually taken by two companies. So 63% is the combined share of Google and Facebook in the United States digital advertising market last year. What's even more important, of course the digital market is growing very fast, it's taking money from television, but you know, most of the growth, 95% of the growth is actually taken by these two companies. Why is that? Because in the West, Google and Facebook 
have actually won the attention economy. They aggregated the biggest audiences, so they can also deliver the biggest audiences to advertisers. Is China any different? I'm not sure, sir. Three companies actually last year had 72% of digital advertising market here, and they take most of the growth. China may be very different from the West, but it seems that media markets they tend to go in similar directions. So what's happening with the remaining money, with the remaining 30%? So in this in, in the West, from every dollar that an advertiser spends on advertising, the publisher gets 30 cents. Because the rest is actually taken by different ads technology companies. You know, trading desks, DMPs, data providers, DSPs, ad exchangers, SSPs, ad networks. There's plenty of intermediaries in the advertising that take actually most of the money. So you are not competing for the remaining 30%. You are competing for the remaining 10%. So maybe we should ask platforms for money. We should ask them, you know, you need to pay us. You know, we provide you value, we provide you content, you need to pay us. So in the West, you know, I've done a survey among publishers and what I found is that the average share of Google or Facebook's contributions to publishers' digital revenue is 5 to 7%. I don't have the numbers from China. You can tell me how much money do you get from WeChat? How much money do you get from Weibo? Who gets more than 5%? Please raise your hand. No hands here. You can, you can think that maybe the biggest players can get more money. So, this is the benchmark study from the United States. The biggest players like the New York Times, the Washington Post, ABC Television, CBS, they get no more than $20 million from four major platforms in the West. YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat. $20 million may sound like a lot, but it's not. Think that, for example, the newsroom of the New York Times costs $250 million per year. So how to respond? Some ideas. You can lobby for regulating for interventions from the government. This is what some people do. In Europe, just the European Parliament, just a few days ago, they voted for so-called link tax. So the idea is that no technology company can publish a link to somebody's content without an, without an agreement. And of course, publishers think that they can charge for the agreements. Unfortunately, there have been countries in which such a link tax was already introduced. It was in Spain. The platforms just dropped all the news publishers from search. They just didn't care. There is too many other publishers that want to stay there. So what about launching your own platforms? There are publishers like Axel Springer, you've heard, you've listened to them today. Like uh, Naspers from South Africa, like Shipstead from Norway, that have actually managed to build their own platforms. Unfortunately, these markets seem to be winners take all markets. It means that the first player that gains the highest uh, share actually takes most of the money and all the others just you know take the rest we are talking about you know like the leader can take 70 to 80 percent of the market so maybe we should build alliances maybe the publishers should come together share the data share technology maybe even share customers there are such alliances being launched all over the world in different countries they are very new one year old, two years old, three years old. We don't know the results yet. The thing is that, of course, they are competing for the remaining 30%, or 10%, however you calculate it. It's not going to fund the whole industry. Maybe we can also make users love ads. Do you believe that? No. Nobody loves ads. Okay. So maybe let's come to the root of the problem. The root of the problem is decoupling. The, that, that the user wants to actually avoid activities that uh, the user hates and focus on activities that give them value. Why, how can we make money here? How can we make money here without making people, you know, looking at the 
yards, just to be sure that we made money whenever we publish any piece of content. That's how we come to the question, who else can pay for our content? Who derives value from our content? Let me give you an example of the New York Times. So, of course, they charge consumers. They have digital subscriptions and being a growing business. But it's not all. Content marketeers. There is plenty of companies that actually have so complicated products that they want to tell stories about their products. And who to hire to tell your story if not uh, the best provider of content? So they hire the New York Times to actually write stories about products. It's not the, it's not the newsroom, it's the separate team, but they actually prepare content about products. What about selling stuff? The New York Times invested in a company that uh, publishes reviews about electronics and then takes a cut from retailers if they lead, provide any lead to a customer. It's called the wire cut. Then they started to ask people for money. It's like donations. And they say, if you believe that kids should grow up without false content, you should sponsor subscription to kids. You should sponsor subscription to students. <laughs> so they collect donations. And of course they also sell content through syndication to other publishers. How much money is there? These are the money, these are the numbers from last year. So after 25 years of building their digital advertising business, they are able to make $2 million. Just seven years after starting to charge for content, they already make much more money from digital subscriptions than from advertising. Just two years after starting their e-commerce business, they already make $100 million, half of what they make with digital advertising. And by the way, when we talk about digital advertising, 60 million of it is a new business, just three years old, called, you know, they are branded content. Business. So, what I mean is that for 25 years, publishers tried to hit, you know, wall with their heads, trying to make digital advertising work, and they obviously lost the digital platforms. When one publisher started to look for other business models, all of them seemed to be more successful than actually trying to make the whole, the, the old business model to work. And when we look at the value, you know, they have like 140 million visitors around the world. But when they, are, when they don't pay a subscription and they are just monetized with advertising, you know, the New York Times is able to make $2 per user, per year. But when a user becomes a subscriber, they make suddenly $140 per head. But when they find sometimes somebody who wants to sponsor a student subscription, they found one guy who wanted to pay a million dollars for it. What it all means? We need more business model innovation. Because the product innovation is absolutely not enough. We've been changing, we've been digitizing our newsrooms. We've been creating apps for, you know, decades now. It's not enough. It's not going to save the business. What's going to save the business is that we need to start innovating with the business model that underlines it. Most common business models among publishers, digital display advertising, branded content events, just a half of publishers started to do something with digital subscriptions. One third started to do something with e-commerce. Far away, so what's the change ahead? Most publishers I'm talking to about subscriptions, they say, you know, it always starts as a pricing thing. So it's just marketing department. Oh, we used to have a free content online and now we try to charge. It's a new pricing strategy. Marketing is responsible. It's not a big deal. But then they quickly realize people don't want to pay for what they used to produce. They need to actually start changing the product. And when they change the product, they find that they need to be organized in a different way to do the right product to be able to sell it. 
So what they change, they actually change the business model of the company. So this is the second stage of digital transformation, when people realize it's just not about charging for content. It's actually the change of the whole business model, how you create value, how you deliver value, and how you capture value. But then, when people get there, they realize that actually they need to change something more. They need to ask themselves the, the, the most important question. What's the purpose for the company? What's really the business we are in? Are we in a business of producing content? Are we in a business of selling the arts? Are we in the business of providing information? Are we in the business of actually giving people solutions to their problems? What is really the business we are in? Let me give you just one way of, to, to, to look at it. So, traditionally, we were product-centric companies. We were managing products. We were focusing our businesses on products that are profitable. We were thinking, okay, we have a great product, how many customers I can sell it to? But today, perhaps, we need to think differently. We need to think, we need to be customer-centric. We need to think, okay, we have customers and some of them are more profitable than others. We need to focus on them. And perhaps the question is, not how many products we, not, not how many uh, customers I can sell my product to, but how many products I can sell to my customers. Examples? The Poland's uh, main news website used to sell the ads. Today they sell clothes, homework, travel, finance services. They currently enjoy 58% of revenue coming from e-commerce. Their target for the next year is 75%. Tremendously profitable operation. New Zealand, uh, you know, New Zealand is a very small country. You cannot compare it to China. It's smaller than Wuhan. The whole country is smaller than Wuhan. So, you know, how many subscriptions can they sell? They cannot sell, you know, two million subscriptions. It's just impossible. There is less people in the country. So they started to sell video streaming and broadband and electricity. And their recent product advertised here on the front page is actually health insurance plans. It's not that the company started to build hospitals. They buy services from other hospitals. They package them together. They put a brand and they sell it to their customers. It's about selling more products to the same customers. This is the business that they chose to be in. Another example, business to business. So the American company Bellapo started to think that, you know, the advertising is taken over by Google and Facebook, but, you know, in fact, people don't spend that much money on advertising anymore. When you look at companies spending, they spend increasingly on so-called marketing other than advertising. They spend on sales promotions, then spend, they spend on events, they spend on uh, 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 discounts, they spend on sampling, they spend on many other services, on their website, on content creation, on Facebook, on you know having social media editors to do stories and pictures on Instagram or you know your WeChat and so on. So actually they spend a lot of money on marketing, not that much money on advertising anymore. So why not present yourself as an advertising agency and media sales firms that can actually take money from the customer and organize how to spend it? So this is what Bello is doing. 40% of their revenue is now coming from this kind of integrated marketing business. And the last example, from UK, a company that is absolutely, uh, absolutely uh, amazing, <laughs> essentially, they used to be called Emo. It was a magazine publisher like many of you. You know, they used to publish magazines about everything, cars, you know, nursing, whatever. And they just decided that it's time to focus. And they focus on the, on the business of consumer product retailers and consumer product producers, big businesses. And they found out that these people, they need, to, they need information to make better business decisions. But they no longer maybe need that much journalism and stories, articles. They still have some magazines like Retail Weekly that you know you can read 
stories about you know what Tesco is doing, like big, big, big supermarket chain, what they are doing. But actually, most of the money that they make, they make with information services that are sold in digital via, via subscription. These are services like dashboards, like this one. If you sell fashion, if you have a fashion shop, you want to know what's popular now, what's going on on Amazon, what's going on on other shopping websites. And you get this information in form of a dashboard. It's no longer about writing articles. It's about providing the information that actually helps you know, somebody to make better business decisions. 60% of revenue comes from subscriptions. So, to sum up, it's the customers who disrupt our business and not the platforms. It's important to remember, we need to, we need to focus on what customers actually want from us. What is the problem that they face? Why would they hire us? To respond, we need to address the root of the problem. And the root of the problem is decoupling, that people can decouple consumption of content from seeing the ads. We need to find a way to actually make money with the company itself. We need to innovate more with business models and not just products. Perhaps you may consider charging for content one day, but you need to remember it's not the end game. We build infrastructure, we build relationships with customers, we start analyzing how they consume our content to be actually able to sell other things than just content. It's the start, not the end. And by the way, the opportunities in business to business, like formerly advertising, they still exist. But you need to remember that marketing is much, much, much more than just advertising. Thank you very much.